first. Right? <laughs> and then from, from prote providing protection, they would provide the protection, especially it became a question of pride in the neighborhood and almost tribalism when the anti Semites would come from the other neighborhoods of Irish and Italian Polacks to pick on the Jews. So the, um, the, 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 the push guard vendors would scream for the health protection. And the kids themselves would come out and beat up the goyim <laughs> because it was a question of Jewish pride. It was a question of protecting their uncles, their fathers, uh, their brothers, their relatives, and so forth. So they weren't going to bow their heads after 2,000 years. This was the mentality that came out of the ghettos. We don't bow our heads anymore. We're not, we're not going to be uh, uh, self-hating and ghetto-minded. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be, we're gonna be somebody different. We're going to be tough. Uh, and they were tough. And at the early ages, some of these kids weren't even 20 years of age. When it comes about the, the, um, the question of prohibition, and uh, they were engaged by the bootleggers to provide, uh, to run the protection for the vehicles, for the trucks and so forth that was involved in the distribution and sale of alcohol, which of course was a, um, a criminal act in violation of the Bolstad Act of 1920. But this also provided tremendous opportunity for kids that came out of the ghettos that had no education or very little education. Most of them were supporting, I know that my father was supporting his mother and his brothers and sisters. And the same thing would happen along his woman and Doc Stature and Abe Green and all these fellas that were taking care of their parents as opposed to today where parents take care of kids in those days it was the it was expected and it was a duty of the kids to take care of the parents and they did and they did it in a very effective job. Now we had in North New Jersey a bootlegger by the name of Joe Reinfeld. Joe Reinfeld went to the to the Longies woman, Abner Longies woman. So how the name Abner Longie Longie. And Longie came from the from the when the pushcart vendors used to get attacked by the Goyim. So in Yiddish he would scream out, Rift the Longer. The, the push card vendors would say, lift the longer meaning call for the long one. The longer meaning the tall one. He was six foot tall, and then from the name longer comes the name Longy. So he was handsome, debonair. He was already had leadership capacity before he even reached his 20th birthday. Now he was running protection together with Doc Statue and all these other fellows that I mentioned. Same thing went on in New York. You had another famous gangster by the name of Arnold Rothstein, name identification, show of hands. One, two, okay, not bad. So far, it's <laughs> Arnold Rothstein was the one to teach the young thugs because he came from a upper class Orthodox family, not of the Lower East Side. But he took Meyer Lansky on the wing, and together with him and Luke, Lucky Luciano, whose story I'll tell a little bit short in a short while to explain the connection. I'm running. Doing it as fast as possible with the rabbi in 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so you had you had them running protection until the point where they said to themselves, we don't run any protection anymore. Mr. Reinfeld and Mr. Uh, Arnold Rothstein, we're now your partners. Because when you go to somebody for protection, and you're not gonna he's not gonna be satisfied with protecting you, he's gonna be satisfied not just being your partner, he's gonna be satisfied when he's your boss. So keep that in mind in case any of you ever want to become, you know, looking to buy protection from my guy Michael over there. You know, I'm here for your services yeah, if you need me. He's going to end up being your partner or your boss. <laughs> so that that eventually takes place, and Meyer Lansky and uh, Bugsy Siegel become now the bosses of the of the drug tra of the um, alcohol alcohol trafficking business, and the same thing in North New Jersey. Longies woman together with Doc Thatcher, they become the bosses. Now, in the 20s, uh, there was, let's talk now, how this, this amalgamation, this formation of the American mafia takes place. So at the same time that the Jews were emerging, and by the way, we had more gangsters than the Italians did. We had more, more criminality. 25% of the prisoners in the New York prison system happened to be Jews, and many of them were in there for really violent crimes that I mentioned before, uh, particularly the, the, uh, the crime of prostitution, uh, which was very prominent in the United States, in the big cities. As a result of women that would come from, the, uh, uh, come from uh, Europe and uh, 
on their, on their either false pretenses or thinking that they were coming because the husband who was there before them and, uh, was working to send them passage to come to reunite with the family. Unfortunately, a lot of these guys took up with the prostitutes, left their wives, and the women themselves were seduced and brought into it. It was a terrible, terrible time as far as American history is concerned, American Jewish history. But it's a reality, it's a fact. Well, our guys like Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, they, they, they were not involved in that. They were, their, their eyesight was on um, a prohibition of alcohol, which at that time provided a fantastic opportunity to make tons and tons of money. Now, comes the Italians. The story is that they were kids since they were youth. I don't know if the story is true or not that Lucky Luciano was going to pick a fight with Meyer Lansky to shake him down because that was the common thing to do for the kids from Little Italy on the other side of the, the other side of the, of the, of the, of the Bowery where the, where the Italians lived and the Jews on the other side. <coughs> the idea was that you shake down the Jewish kids. But supposedly, Meyer Lansky fought back and that would form the friendship between Lucky Luciano. It's a nice story, I don't know if it's true, but basically what does happen is that the structure of the New York Mafia, or the New York underworld, or the Italian underworld, was controlled by two uh, old boys, we call mustache beats. Guys uh, from the old school from Sicily, xenophobic in their mentality, paranoid, we don't trust anybody, if he's not a Sicilian, if he's not one of us, and so forth. And they uh, ruled New York. There was competition between the two, between uh, Salvatore Maranzano and between Joe the Boss Massaria. They came from a place called Castella Marad, which was in Sicily, and they fought over the power of the control of the underworld of New York. Comes a young man by the name of Charles uh, Salvatore Lucania. Now, anybody recognize that, that, that name, Salvatore Lucania? Lucania. Huh? Lucania. All right, man, you, is that your husband? <laughs> Very proud. <isn't> <laughs> Of Jews. Huh? I read the books of Jews. Uh, probably you, but you read my book. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's right, Salvatore Lucani, Charlie Lucky Luciano, how's it get from Lake Lucky? So he was kidnapped by uh, Messaria, and Mr. because they, they wanted the young Turks. The young Turks consisted of the guys that were raised in the United States of America that didn't have this stupid, uh, you know, that. Uh, didn't have the stupid limited uh, mentality that uh, they were forced now. You had uh, Joe Adonis, you had uh, Albert Anastasia, you had uh, Carlo Gambino, you had all these young, uh, what were known as the Young Turks, they were geniuses. Uh, uh, Luke Kanye was a genius and saw the, the possibility of making a lot of money by joining forces with Meyer Lansky and making money with Jews because after all, Jews now had plenty of gangsters. They were Jews, <coughs> the Italians. And we have a reputation for being smart and entrepreneurial. The difference being between we and they, although according to Rashi, they're somehow or another cousins of ours. Is that right, Rabbi? <laughs> uh, you want me to educate you? Know? <laughs> <laughs> Mahdiel was the son of uh, Esau, <coughs> Esau. And according to Rashi, it says, Esau is Rome. Is that right, Rabbi? Yeah. See, I'm not misleading these people. <laughs> <laughs> All right? So they have a similarity to us in terms of our mentality and so forth. Um, I told you the story, Messaria kidnaps him and tries to kill him because uh, Lucky Luciano would not uh, capitulate the demands of Joe Messaria. They cut him up and they leave him for dead. And the mere fact that he survived gave him the name Lucky. So he took on an American name, and James, the, the name's changed from Lucania to Luciana, and uh, they named Charles Lucky Luciano. That, that's how he gets the name Lucky. Anyways, at that point in history, it's the decision of Lucky Luciano, we have to get rid of the old mustache Pete's, mm -hmm. we're gonna have to kill him. And so they, Masaria, Joe the boss Masaria, was killed in a restaurant in Cone Island, an Italian restaurant in Cone Island, by three Italians and one Jew, and the Jew was Bugsy Siegel. And the other hand, the question of killing Maranzano, since he knew all the Italians, <coughs> they, they picked, Meyer Lansky was asked to pick his people, so he sent in three, four Jews. 
One, I believe, was Louis Rush, but he never admitted to it. I've asked him a million times, but he swore that it wasn't him, but everybody else said it was. There was some Bugsy Siegel again. There was a fellow title down from the Dutch Schultz crowd, the Liz Mob. And the fourth guy made, was a pride of the Jewish people because he was Shomer Shabbos, ate kosher, wore since he's had a keep on his head, and observed the, the, the Sabbath rabbi, but never would kill anybody on Shabbat unless it was. <laughs> <laughs> in his world, he was known as a tzaddik. <laughs> Noach was a tzaddik in his time, and uh, Sam Red Levine was a tzaddik in his time. With the elimination of that, it becomes the formation of the American Mafia. We have a combination partnership with the Italians and the Jews. Meyer Lansky is the boss, although there's guys that are on an equal level with him, and one of them is Abner Longy Zwilman. Zwilman, incidentally, was a handsome, debonair guy, ran north of Jersey, picked the mayor. We had a Jewish mayor for eight years. We knew everything that was going on in the city. Every cop answered the uh, Every prostitute was a, a spy for the mob. Everything that went on in the city of Newark was under full control of Abner Longy's woman, who, by the way, was also a proud Jew. Um, all our guys, there, there's no such thing as a guy with an identity problem that, you know, I'm ashamed I should wear my keep. I shouldn't wear my keep. I admit I'm a Jew and so forth and so forth. In my book, there's a picture of nine guys. They were looking for one more man to make a minion that was picked up in a lineup in, in New York, uh, all Jews and tough, tough guys. And um, okay, so Longy's woman, he ruled as far as the United, as far as the state of New Jersey was concerned, was known as Al Capone of North New Jersey. There was bitter enmity, enmity between the Italians and the Jews. They fought over territory. The boss of the Italians, his name was Ricardo Richie, Richie the boot, boot, the bootlegger, Boyardo. Uh, I knew all of these people. And there was a gigantic war that took place, and Longy's woman sent hitmen to get rid of the, the boot. Uh, shot him, he survived. And uh, to prevent violence, which was bad for business, Al Capone, the story is that he came in from Chicago, he came to Newark, New Jersey, and they made shulam between the Jews and the Italians, between Longy's woman and between the boot, Boyardo. The boot owned a restaurant called the Victoria Castle that was on Park Avenue in Newark, New Jersey, a classy Italian restaurant, and they had a three-day celebration, three days, three nights to celebrate the armistice, and after that, peace reigned until 1959. When Longy's Wilman died by hanging, and again that's um, a, a, a legend of the of the mob as to whether he killed him, whether he hung himself, committed suicide, or he, he was killed by the Italians. But immediately after he died, then uh, my father's partner, was a fellow by the name of Gerardo Catina, Jerry Catina, was the head of the Genovese crime family. He emerged as the boss over. Everybody. So I think that the death of Longy's woman terminates the the, uh, the the moment of the last moments of glory as far as the Jewish mob is concerned. And so, um, getting on to further kind of information as far as what we did. Well, so I just told you that our boys protected the ghetto, but now in the 30s, after the end of probation, pro, uh, prohibition comes about the. Um, Prohibition ends in 1933 coincides with the with the depression and with a rising tide of anti-Semitism in the United States. Henry Ford, here born in Massachusetts, he himself was a terrible anti-Semite. Besides Henry Ford, you had Coglin, Father Coglin, uh, who was on radio constantly uh, preaching anti-Semitism. Had the then we had come from Germany a a, um, a real mumser by the name of Fritz Kuhn. Fritz Kuhn. Fritz Kuhn was uh, uh, the father was the uh, founder of the Brown Shirt or the American Nazi Party, which was known as the German Bund. Newark, New Jersey, which is of course my point of reference, and since where I'm born, that's where I grew up, that's where I come from. Newark, New Jersey was a basically uh, we had a large Jewish population, as I indicated, 
But we had a tremendous German population all the way back to the 1800s because of water. Water was so good in, in Newark that it was good for making beer. And we, as a result, we at one time had 19 breweries. We had a large, um, wealthy German community. But after World War II, the defeat of the, of the Kaiser Wilhelm, so what happens is that um, um, there was a large immigration again of Germans coming to the United States. Fritz Kuhn Yamach Shemo, which declares himself as the American, uh, American Adolf Hitler. And he starts his campaign in, in New Jersey, basically in Newark. Uh, Springfield Avenue in Newark, we had a lot of beer gardens in that time. They would uh, congregate, the Nazis would congregate for the purpose of spurring their anti-Semitism. Afterwards, all charged up, they'd go into the Jewish neighborhoods and so forth. It was a prize fight. <clears throat> we had many prize fighters. We had something like thousands of, of professional Jewish prize fighters. <laughs> One of the prize fighters in North New Jersey was a fellow by the name of uh, Abramowitz who fought under the name because many of the fellows that fought fought under the changed names so the mothers and fathers wouldn't know that they were prize fighting. This fellow's name took the name Nat Arno. Now, Nat Arno, went to Longy's woman, the boss, and told him we're gonna form an organization, we're gonna call it the Minutemen, in honor of those Minutemen of the Revolutionary War, when Paul Revere went around and said, we, we, we the British are coming, not you, not, not you. <laughs> the other, the other. So when that was happening, they called an organization, the Minutemen, and our Minutemen used to hang in bars, saloons, clubs, and when a phone call would come in and say, we're, the, the, the Bund is meeting up on Springfield Avenue, 18th Street. Come on, guys. They bring their baseball bats, their <laughs> jackhammers, their brass knuckles, and they went to work on the Germans as they, the Nazis as they were coming out of the, before they even come out, they were throwing stink bombs in a place. This was a constant war. A great book was written by a friend of mine, Warren Grover, called The Nazis in Newark. It's a fantastic reading document that every member of the Minutemen and got most of them before they passed away. So that the story is documented is a wonderful book, but it's not as good as mine. <laughs> so in any event, that takes place in the 30s, is not only takes place in North New Jersey, Judge Nathan Perlman, a well-known judge in New York, reaches out to Meyer Lansky and he says to him, we must do the same thing in, North, in New York City, and up in uh, Yorkville, which is a German neighborhood, we need to have the same kind of response that's going on in North New Jersey. Meyer Lansky, on his own, picks a group of guys. Lucky Luciano, which was very gracious, says to him, Meyer, I'm prepared to provide you with my guys. So Meyer Lansky's answer was very patriotic. He said, Lucky, thank you very, very much, Charlie. That's very gracious of you. This is a Jewish problem, and it will be solved by Jews. All right? Did anybody pay these guys? Did anybody thank them? Privately. Every Jew felt the pride of what they were doing. But our legitimate organizations were condemning them. These people are thugs. These people are gangsters. And so forth and so forth. But in the meantime, they were resolving the issue of anti-Semitism, which was growing uh, <coughs> exponentially in the United States. We had a problem in Minneapolis. There was a gangster up there by the name of Dave Berman, together with other gangsters, Yeti Bloom, Herman Faster, Sam Turan. They effectively took care of what was known as the Silver Shirts. There was an anti-Semite up there by the name of Dudley. Willie, uh, Dudley Pelly, William Dudley Pelly, all right? He again, with that anti-Semitism up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, St. Paul, throughout the Midwest. We also had a great struggle in Chicago, Illinois, we had a fellow there by the name of Barney Ross. Anybody want to raise their hand and tell me they know him? The boxer. Well, he's a boxer. Not just an ordinary boxer. World champion. Triple crown champion, American war hero. Fought in Guadalcanal and got the silver medal of honor for bravery. Fantastic man. Very, very dear friend of my dad. Very good. They were together nonstop, inseparable. Together in Chicago, Illinois, they fought the anti-Semites with another gangster by the name of Jack Rubenstein. Hello, <laughs> nobody. Well, then, what if I mention the name Jack Ruby? Oh, yeah. 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 Jack Ruby was a gangster, a Jewish gangster. All right, <coughs> the guy that killed Harvey Oswald. And at the same time, 
when it came to beating up uh, anti-Semites. That's what their job was. They did an effective job. So this was something going on also here in England. Your gangsters were fighting uh, 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 mostly. 1936, Cable Street confrontation. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, so you see, up till now, I've been telling you nothing but truth. <laughs> <laughs> and if I, some things I don't know, all right, I'm pretty good at making them up. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows that I'm making it up. All right. Now that you, I told quickly the story as far as our boys, what they did during the 30s, during the war effort, 1942, ship called the SS Normandy. Docked in New York, all right? Blew up, sunk in the port of New York. <clears throat> Who blew it up? Well, we believe it was German sabotage, spies, this and that. A fellow by the name of Moses Polakoff was the lawyer for the mob, all right? It was a fellow by the name of Charles Hepperton. Charles Hepperton was U.S. Naval Intelligence. Reaches out to Moses Polakoff and says to him, we need the help of the mob. We need to control the port of New York the stevedores. The stevedores consist of two ethnic groups. One is Irish, and we're fearful that they're going to be anti-British, all right, and the sentiments against the United States. And the other one is the um, the Italians, and their boss, uh, their, their their sentiments might lie with Mussolini. We're just going to show that the United States Department of Intelligence didn't do their homework because Mussolini hated the mafia, all right. So the mob was controlled by two ethnic groups. So again, they go to Ma, uh, uh, Lansky, and Lansky says, well, it's fine, I'll be glad to assist you, but I can't do, I can't do anything. It's the man that you, your guy Dewey, who at that time was the prosecutor in New York, he framed uh, Lucky Luciano on a prostitution charge, sent him up to Dannemore up in the north, and the border between Canada and, and uh, the United States of America freezing up there. It's cold. <laughs> It's cold and the guy's not getting his shrimp marinara, he's not getting his lobster and brown diablo, his pasta, so he's getting none of this stuff. For God's sakes, you want this man to help you, bring him down. They brought him down to Great Meadows, feed him his Italian dishes, and provide him with some nocturnal pleasures. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Rabbi, that meant that he was studying Talmud at night. <laughs> 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 the order comes down from Lucky Luciano. Yes, we're going to be patriots. He sends the instructions to two guys. One guy is Eddie McGrath, the boss over the Irish, and the other one goes to Sox Lancer, who runs the Italians on the port. And from now on, guys, we are proud Americans. Watch out for sabotage. Watch out for Nazis, Italians, uh, anybody that's allied with Mussolini, so forth. The entire war. Nothing happens. No sabotage. Nothing ever again happens. Nothing takes place. Now, the deal was worked out. They go to Dewey and they said, Mr. Dewey, this man, all right, give him a governor's uh, pardon. He was a great American and patron. Deal was worked out. The mob says to Dewey, Dewey, schmuck, do this. We'll throw our support behind you when you run for governor of the state of New York. And we know your political ambitions don't stop at, at being governor. You want to be president. We will throw our support behind you. All right? He frames the Luciano, and then on the other hand, he says, yeah, I'll take your support. All, right? all this is done nice, done through lawyers. All right, nice and kosher. He said, I'll, I'll grant him a governor's uh, pardon on the basis that he goes back to Italy. So he was deported back to Italy, and now he goes back to Italy Who's left in charge but Meyer Lansky? Meyer Lansky's got the scepter, the boss, Lucky Luciano. All right. Everybody's got to do it through him and so forth. Besides which, there's a fellow by the name of Vincent Jimmy Blue Eyes Aloy, who I used to eat lunch with on a regular basis in his, well, he was in his 90s, and he shared with me many stories, none of which I'm going to share with any of you. Today, <laughs> right? Unless I get an absolute pledge, you're going to buy my book. I'm desperate. <laughs> Michael, see who's going to cash a check for me. I will do that for you, sir. <laughs> okay. So going further, as far as that's concerned, so the war effort, again, this was a tremendous uh, contribution for the American war effort. Now let's talk about the state of Israel. All right? Good. I have a president, President Harry S. Truman, Midwest uh, anti-Semite. Uh, Midwest guy, good guy, but typical Midwest anti-Semite. 
uh, his wife would not allow a Jew to come into the house. However, when he was a young fellow, he was partners in the haberdashers, two haberdashers in Lincoln, Missouri, with a fellow by the name of Eddie Jacobson. And Eddie Jacobson was his pal from all the way back. Now he's the president of the United States. All right? So Eddie Jacobson is used by the Zionist contact guy, Truman, to tell him we want to send somebody to meet him. We need a support in order to gain recognition for the state of Israel when Ben Gurion is going to make the announcement for the state of Israel. Right? So he used to call up Truman. Truman said, you kite little bastard, you. Don't you bother me again. You want to bring me a Jew? I ain't got no time for you or any other Jew. Hocked him, hocked him, designed him, stocked him. Finally, he brings him Chaim Weitzman. And Truman becomes impressed with Chaim Weitzman. He's a the Torah, talks, nice, explains. What's the circumstance that Truman says? You know what? George Marshall, George C. Marshall, Secretary of State, famous general World War II, he tells Truman, if you recognize the state of Israel, I'm going to I'm gonna quit. And I'm going to embarrass you. Truman says, that's what it's got to be. It's got to be. The State Department was always anti-Semitic, always pro-Arab. 100%. <laughs> now, at that point, Truman announces his, uh, and recognizes, like our guy Donnie Trump did yesterday. All right? <laughs> Uh, but she's gonna do the greatest thing on the face of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> nobody else would do it. Not the bad man did it. <laughs> Life is so peculiar, huh? So strange, so fascinating. Um, okay, I just had a thought for a moment, but I, uh, I'm gonna withdraw that thought. I'll continue with what I've read. <laughs> but you people want to hear. Um, okay, so Truman recognizes 20 minutes after. Ben Gurion announces, all right? But now we know that there's going to be war. We know that we're going to be invaded by the Arabs. First, we got to get rid of the British, all right? Because the British were bastards of bloody <laughs> bastard anti Semites. Cyprus sending people that were in a, in, the, in a Holocaust concentration camp, yeah. put them back in concentration camps in Cyprus. Eddie Jacobson did an effective job. We finally get him in, we get the announcement, we get support. Very good. We're doing terrific. All right, except now, Truman, under inordinate pressure from the State Department, invokes again the 1939 Neutrality Act, stating any supply of arms, weapons, cash, material support to Palestine, either Jews or Arabs, is a criminal act. Oh, uh, what do we do now? So Ben Gurion sends a fellow by the name of Gideon Zizlani, this man is trusted, confidant, go to the United States, talk to all those legitimate guys. Organizations get their support. <coughs> but he goes and talks to him. This Steve Shiga, we're going to do something illegal. Never go back to Palestine. Tell Ben Gurion to look for some other way to get there. Goes back, tells Ben Gurion. Ben Gurion says, "Okay." Goes to the United States, looks up an old pal of his by the name of uh, Resnick, Zemel Resnick, owned an amusement park called the Palace Amusements in Esbury Park, New Jersey. He was a Soldier together with Ben Gurion in the British Army during World War One. He tells him, I need help. What kind of help do you need? I need guns, weapons, this, that. Right. Fantastic movement. And then he introduces him to a fellow by the name of Rudolf Sonnenborn. Also, in a great book called The Pledge by Slater, 1970, in honor of the Zionist industrialists in the United States that amassed fortunes of money and used that money to buy up surplus weapons arms from World War II uh, to get around the uh, act, to get around the Neutrality Act. They didn't. They violated the Neutrality Act. These guys were legitimate businessmen, but saw the need to supply the arms and the weapons. Of course, we got help at that time from Messer, from Czechoslovakia. So we had uh, at that point the Sonoborg group that was making deals all over, picking up the weapons and so forth. But how to ship it? Gonna ship it to the port of New York and New Jersey. Well, who? How are you gonna do it? It's all illegal. It's contraband. How are you gonna manifest it? <clears throat> Go see Meyer Lansky, Longy's woman. Go see Meyer Lansky, Longy's woman. Not a problem, boys. Call up Albert Anastasia. Call up Frank Costello. He's the Frank Costello was after Lucky Luciano. He, he was the boss of the Italians. Albert Anastasia was together with the Jews, Jacob Gura. And left your book called them and murder incorporated. So what they do at that point 
is they um, agreed to do whatever they have to do. And the Longshoremen cooperated in World War II, and they cooperate again. We ship everything under false manifest. Dynamite goes out as uh, fertilizer. Uh, weapons go out as agricultural equipment, and so forth. And stuff gets shipped to Palestine. Now, Ergun, we had a movement separate from the uh, Haganah, which was Ben Gurion. We have a guy, I'm sure you know all these things, and I'm just, you know, boring you with these details. All right, Menachem Beg was head of Ergun, sends a guy to see a fellow by the name of Mickey Cohen, all right, Bugsy Siegel, California. <coughs> Tell him that the Jews are fighting for independence and fight for statehood. And it's a fantastic. Well, these guys, are, but our guys, didn't, were in sophisticated in the sense that made a distinction between the left and the right, between Haganah, between Ergun. Uh, probably in their mentality, they would have been late. Uh, Leahy was a mentality that was developed by Yair Stern, who was the splinter group from Aragon that said, uh, we don't care that the British are fighting the Germans, we'll fight the British, as long as they're not withstand the fact they fight the Germans, where Aragon says, no, we will not fight the Germans, the British, as long as they're fighting Germans. And that was a split at that point in history. But as far as the, um, as, uh, the Aragon was concerned, Mickey Cohn runs a campaign, raises $120,000 in, uh, in a campaign in Los Angeles, California, in a comedy club for each other's friends, and tells them this is what you're going to be doing. Raised $120,000 in stock of boat, a ship called the Altalena. Name recognition on the Altalena. Very good. Altalena was an air going ship. That went from Marseille, the port of Marseille, to Beach Vitkin. Confrontation takes place between Haganah and Irgun at that point. And unfortunately, communication broke down. I was not there. I can't tell you exactly what happened. But Rabin, who was together at that time with uh, um, David Magurian, was ordered, or on his own, fired a rocket onto the ship in 19 boys died. Menachem Begin got on um, Army radio that night, or, or Irgun radio. And advised, and not advised, but declared to the members of Ergun that we will not take revenge because Jews do not kill Jews. Menachem Begin becomes a great, great hero because had there been no uh, understanding, of it, no declaration from the words or the mouth of Menachem Begin, there certainly would have been civil war. 19 Jewish boys died that day on Bitkin uh, Beach. Uh, a terrible story. But, okay, so that, that was the connection, not just at one time connection, there was many connections. I used to eat in a little Italian restaurant up in a, uh, where's uh, Tony, uh, Tony Salerno, up in uh, East Harlem. I used to meet an old man named Sammy Cass, and he used to tell me that they loaded up ships. He says, these ships, my, and they couldn't make it to Coney Island, much less make it to Palestine. The, this guy was strictly Ergun. All the guys, that we, all the mob guy, he was a mob guy, did something like 20 some odd years. So did some real serious time. <clears throat> stone cold, stone cold gangster <clears throat> killer. And when it came to being Jewish, there was no ants, there was no ifs, there was no buts, there were patriots. Like our patriots in, uh, in Palestine at the time, when Yitzhak Shamir sends two little, uh, two young Israeli Sparty kids, uh, um, Bensuri, Eliyahu Bensuri and Yaliyahu Khan, two kids from Lebanon, go assassinate Lord Moyne in Cairo. He's the highest official of the British government. We don't like the British government's attitude. We'll send them a message. They killed him, they assassinate him. They were caught, they were tried, they were hung, and they sang a hot tick, but together at the same moment that the rope was put around their necks. All right? 19 and 22 years of age. Do we know? Can we understand? Can we appreciate this kind of mentality? All right? Now, it, it, I just, there's other stories, many other stories that killed, um, what was his name, Bernadette, Count Bernadette, who was the, um, uh, Bernadette was the Swedish high official, highest official of the United Nations, <coughs> same thing, hit team, same guy, uh, Shamir. By the way, when they took out uh, uh, Moyne, Moyne was a close intimate associate of friend of um, Winston Churchill, this was the Guinness family. Guinness for the beer, the Anglo-Irish, aristocratic family and so forth. And it, 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 it changed the attitude of, of Winston Churchill to some extent. He warned Kyle Weitzman, 
I don't like this. These, I don't like what you guys are doing. You better put a leash on your on your dogs. So, all right, people, I, I'm going to tell you another story about Tibor Rosenbaum. He owned a bank in Switzerland. He was a hero during the Budapest uh, occupation by the Nazis. He saved many Jewish lives, goes to Switzerland, opens up a bank called the International Bank du Credit. And that bank was the Mossad bank and it also laundered all the monies that were going to Palestine. Years later, it was the bank for the rake-off coming out of Las Vegas casinos that went to Meyer Lansky in Miami and was deposited in the various accounts of all those guys that were investors in Las Vegas, Nevada. So, I can tell you so many more stories, but the rabbi said 40 minutes. I'm gonna cut it short. Questions and answers, let's go. Yes, dear. Um, well, I was particularly interested in the fact that you helped Simon Wittenfall in the quest to apprehend Joseph okay. and Mabel and bring to justice. Okay. My question, my question was, putting that that's true, um, my question was, um, obviously Mabel evaded justice. But Pardon? Obviously Mabel evaded justice. Right. Um, did you ever get anywhere near locating him? Or First of all, let me tell you my, how I connected with the uh, Simon Wittenfall. Uh, first, I'm not from that generation that I talked about today. I'm the next generation, and I am the caboose. I yeah. really am the last of that world. Wow. So I can tell so many stories. I was a, 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 a die in the womb Jew as a kid. As a little kid, I just, you know, it was transmitted down from those people. But all my other friends were listening to Jack and the Beanstalk falling asleep at night. My old man was telling me about Jewish gangsters that were killing Goya. <laughs> this was in my brain. So there was a very famous picture comes out of the Warsaw Ghetto, and I'm sure everybody's seen that little kid coming out and a Nazi with a rifle to his head. All right, 1943. Think about it, I'm saying to myself, that could have been me. By circumstance of birth, I could have been born there. This kid could have been born there. So I'm going to do something. I can't fight Nazis and beat them up like my father's people did. All right. But I'm certainly going to contribute to the course as far as Lisa Paul is concerned. I, I was impressed. My wife was a girl from Argentina, Jewish girl from Argentina. The story fascinated me. And I one day was in Vienna, first time doing business as a kid. I went to meet the man and I told him, I'm here to help you and so forth. The closer we came, there was a sighting of, of Mandela in Asuncion, Paraguay. But I was warned when I went down to Asuncion, Paraguay, watch my step, because the dictator of the country, his name was Alfredo Strossa, and he was the, a, a descendant of the grandson of Germans, and he welcomed all the Nazis into Paraguay. In protection. I went on an airplane, he told me, the guy that I went to see was a fellow by the name of Louis and Lom Schumstein. He told me, he warned me, watch my step while in Paraguay, take care of my slot machine business, don't get involved in politics. <coughs> he told me there had been a sighting of Mengele. He swore to me that he was going to do everything within his power to help Weasel. Told me the name of some people. And I'm on an airplane going from the Sunshine Paraguay one day, Buenos Aires, uh, business, and this couple sitting next to me talking Yiddish, and I said, Yeah, I play Yiddish. <laughs> oh, that's very nice, American guy, you know. Louis Shumstein, Louis Shumstein, yeah. Louis Shumstein, oh, you're the American kid, let me tell you the story woman was in the concentration camp when Mengele was in the concentration camp. She had a dry goods store in a Sunshine Paraguay and walked Mengele one day with two guys. And in the minute that he walked in, he understood this woman's response. She recognized him. And he understood she made a U-turn and left the country. And that's it. Supposedly he died in Brazil. They found his, uh, his remains in Brazil. Yes, sir. Can you tell me how Arnold Rothstein fixed the World Series in 1919? He didn't. He didn't. <laughs> the truth of the matter is he, he probably didn't. But the story, they, you know, to the middle. Arnold Rothstein fixed the World Series together with a former prize fighter by the name of Abe Adele. And let me tell you another story real fast about Jewish pride. You want to hear another one? Yeah. yeah. In, those, in those days, all right, uh, guys would change their names. <clears throat> when they locked so that the mothers and fathers wouldn't know that. One day there's a guy by the name of Greenberg fighting in Newark on Springfield Avenue, Laura Garden. The referee was a fellow by the name of uh, Jaime Kubel, dear friend of my dad's. Suffered no objectivity whatsoever. If a Jew was fighting, he got more than the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> so Greenberg got knocked down that night, right? First round, he got knocked down. So Jaime goes over to him, he goes, 
one. <laughs> he says, one and a quarter. <laughs> and by the time one and a half, he says, them, don't you understand, you dumb Jew? I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. I'm giving you a slow count. Guy looks up at him, I mean, he says, no, I mean. I'm not Jewish, I'm Italian. Eight, nine, ten, you're out. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Yes, sir. What's your favorite of film? That was asked yesterday. Godfather one. Yeah. All right? Yeah. That's a perfect, perfect description of the old school world. Right. Very, very good. Marlon Brenda. My father's partner was Jerry Catina. Jerry Catina was the boss of the Genovese crime family. And a man could have run General Electric. He could have run, according to my father, General Electric. He could have run the Pentagon. He could have been President of the United States, according to my always tailored, always very low key, <clears throat> read four newspapers every morning, self educated, knew what was going on in the world, and knew how to understand people's psychology and so forth, and knew obviously how to render justice, protecting, protecting the unprotected when the unprotected merited it, and at the same time rendering the ultimate justice when a guy was a threat to everybody else's existence. When you go into a world, right, you walk into the Orthodox Shul, all right, there's a machitza, women get over here, men you go over here, guys cover your head, those are the rules. You're walking into that world. When you go into an illegal wor a world of illegal commercial activity, it's got its own rules, it's got its own re uh, traditions, its own regulations. If you can't deal with it, get the hell out of it, all right? Is it an easy life? Meyer Lansky died a miserable existence and a miserable life, all right? At the end of the day, he died broke. $300,000, Jimmy Blue Eyes collected some street money, gave it to him. As far as any other money is concerned, possibly his brother Jake wound up with money. He blew $16 million at the Riviera Hotel in Havana, Cuba, and I think in my way of understanding how that world functions, he probably had to lay off a lot of those shares that he had in Vegas to some of those uh, uh, young, those other guys that put up the money based upon the fact that Meyer said, I'm gonna personally morally guarantee it or whatever, whatever the case may be, or maybe even Meyer's life was at stake, all right? Nobody, nobody's bigger than the system itself, all right? Any other questions? So, yes, sir. What do you think? Yeah, um, so. Uh, but say it in, in, in a form of English that I can understand. <laughs> okay, I'll do this. Right. Um, what do you think of Jake LaMotta? What do I think of him? Jake LaMotta. Jake LaMotta? Yeah. What do you think of him? Tell him to make what I think. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. What's <laughs> 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 Bugsy Siegel? Bugsy Siegel, nobody really knows actual fact, but the probability is that Meyer Lance could go and say I'm sure that the Italians overruled Meyer. Must have said to him, we tried to say Bugsy too many times. You tried to say Bugsy too many times. He's out of control, that broad, that Virginia Hill, that girl that, you know, that, uh, you know, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but I, that's my own understanding of it. Um, I'm very friendly with the daughter of Alan Smiley. The guy that was sitting together in the parlor that night that Bugsy Siegel got killed. And uh, basically, the, he conveyed to her that it was a, a decision made by others overruling Meyer Lansky. Uh, because there's a better way. Yes, sir. Um, I My, uh, gentlemen, uh, I'll get back to you in just a second. Right. Yeah. I can't remember who it was, but isn't the story that one of the mobsters was in Italy? Right. And was in a villa, and right. he said he. Uh, he had the opportunity to kill Mussolini and his girlfriend at the time said that's no, Bugsy, that's Bugsy Siegel. Siegel. is that true or is that that's good bullshit <laughs> 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 no, that's a nice story go ahead yes yeah. sir <laughs> um, let's speak up loud so I can yeah um, did you have a role in the stand mob? up stand up sir. Um, did you have a role in the mob did I have a role where? In the mob. Did I have a role for breakfast or what? <laughs> <laughs> a role in the mafia? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I myself uh, had two state cases, two New Jersey state cases, three federal cases. Um, the first one was for passing a red light. 
The other one I think was for jaywalking. I ran illegal gambling. When LaGuardia knocked out gambling in 1941 and destroyed all of the business of Meyer Lansky and Frank Vestello, we say there was no machines, uh, no gambling machines uh, in the city of New York until 1977. I got a brilliant idea one day. I woke up and I said, what am I running all over the world trying to do business with everybody else, making others rich? I got a third world nation right across the river. It's called New York City. <laughs> if you go to Astoria, Queens, at that time, you had more Greeks in Astoria than you had in, uh, in Athens, Greece. You want more Italians? We had 20 neighborhoods of Italians. You want Cubans? We had endless neighborhoods of Cubans, Russians, Jamaicans, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, uh, Irish. Every neighborhood is a, is a, is a, is a world. And so in 1977, I got this idea and I started putting out gambling devices in all these little neighborhoods, uh, clubs, uh, bars, and so forth. It took two months for me to gain national recognition, all right? That's how good I was. Uh, the two major organizations that came looking for me, one was the FBI and the other was the mob. <laughs> so I dealt with both for something like 18, 19 years. I had three federal, two state cases, and ultimately, in merit of the great service that I performed for the United States of America in providing slot machines in the city of New York, <laughs> the federal government granted me a two-year paid vacation. <laughs> kosher food. <laughs> Peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> Next question. Any more questions? Huh? Okay, so let's go for book signing. Here's the deal. All right? The book signing is like this. The official book price is 25 English pounds, all right? I want everybody here to walk out with a book today. <laughs> Nobody's gonna ask you a single question. This kid over here is gonna keep his mouth shut. Whatever you put in front of him, he's gonna accept. I'm gonna sign a book for you, and you're gonna get the hell out of here. You're gonna read the book. One last thing, however. You're gonna write, you're gonna post a review. Whether you like the book or not, the <laughs> review is gonna be the best that you ever wrote. Okay, come on, let's go. Really? <laughs>